my brothers and my beautiful sisters, remember, we can only change the world when the people in it changes. Repeat after me. What does it take to be free? What does it take to be free? What does it mean for equality? What does it mean for equality? Justice, justice, peace, peace, justice, justice, peace. And we scream equality, 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 equality. What does it take to be free? What does it take to be free? What does it mean for equality? What does it mean for equality? What does it take to be free? What does it take to be free? What does it mean for equality? What does it mean for equality? Justice, justice, peace, peace, justice, justice, peace, and we scream equality. Equality, equality, justice, justice, peace, peace, justice, justice, peace, and we scream equality, 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 equality. Good evening. And welcome to Unlock Your Power to Unrig the System, our nonpartisan virtual roundtable on race and democracy. I'm Ronaldo Pearson, Chief Diversity Officer and Director of External Affairs at Represent Us. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. And that powerful song you just heard was Freedom by Marky Jackson and Broderick Thompson a Texas-based duo known as Knowledge and Gift. Thank you both. We're here today to discuss two of the most important topics in America today, race and democracy. In the wake of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, a rallying cry for change has reached city halls state legislatures, elections, corporate offices, cultural arenas, and stages across the country, proving that racial justice is not a partisan issue. Relatedly, in the wake of an anti-democracy decade that started with the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision and continued with its 2013 Shelby versus Holder decision gutting the 1965 Voting Rights Act, my generation has become the first to witness America become less democratic. We've seen two powerful grassroots movements rise up to face these challenges. The New York Times has re reported that the Black Lives Matter movement is now the largest in US history with over 90% of its protests being nonviolent, according to Time Magazine. And in 2018, the cross-partisan democracy movement won more pro-democracy and anti-corruption electoral reforms at the state and local levels than at any point in US history. Now, it represent us, and UNRIG specifically, we are conveners, breakers of silos, and today we are bringing together activists and advocates engaged in both the fight for racial justice and the fight to save our democracy for a powerful evening of conversation, culture, and consciousness. And we couldn't be having this conversation on a better day. Today is National Voter Registration Day a nonpartisan civic holiday. Since it was first observed in 2012, 3 million voters have registered on the holiday. And tonight, we wanna to add to that number. So at any time throughout today's call, we encourage you to go to represent.us slash vote. We'll be sharing that screen throughout the 
night's programming. And we want you to go to that link to check your registration status and register to vote. Now let's get to our agenda. Over the course of tonight's hour and 45 minutes of programming, we'll see a must see presentation on the history of race and racism in the United States. And I'm telling you to brace yourselves because I can almost guarantee you have yet to see anything like this in school. Two, we'll see a, fa a fast paced panel discussion with leading advocates for racial justice and democracy reform from the right and left, followed by an audience Q&A. We'll also see a powerful conversation between actor Omar Epps and activist Desmond Mead, the man who restored voting rights to 1.4 million Americans. And throughout the event, we'll feature musical performances by finalists in the Songs for Good 2020 Challenge a songwriting contest to crowdsource a new soundtrack for democracy. The top five songs will be announced starting tonight and throughout the week. So head to songsforgood.org to find out the latest. Now we've disabled the attendee chat feature just to discourage Zoom bombing, but our team will use the chat box to share links, speaker bios and other information with you throughout the event. Click the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. To ask questions at any point during the programming, you can use the Q&A box. So click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We won't be able to get to every question, but we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. So now let's get started. In order to understand where we are today, we need to start by looking back to our past. And one of the most powerful ways I've seen this done is through the history of race and racism in the United States timeline that you're about to see. It is my pleasure to introduce Deborah Cohen and Angelica Castro of Human and Common one of the most sought after and innovative DEI consultancies in the field today. Thank you represent us for having us. We really appreciate being here. Thank you, Ronaldo, Alex, and everyone at Rec represent us. We're thrilled to be here with you. So what you're all about to see is a small segment of our timeline on the history of race and racism in the United States. This is a part of our training called Interrupting Racism, which is a compassionate experiential approach to learning skills for dismantling racism and amplifying racial equity. We hope you all check us out. History of racism in the United States timeline. Created by Nialina Ali with Deborah Cohen, Kishla Perez, Shayla Perez, and Lynn Yanis. 1525 to 1866, transatlantic slave trade. 12.5 million humans were kidnapped in Africa and shipped to North America, the Caribbean, and South America. Children typically comprised at least 26% of a slave ship's human cargo. In 1619, the first enslaved Africans were brought to Jamestown, Virginia. Like Native Americans, they hailed from many different tribes and regions, but in the United States were grouped as one category of people, Negro slaves. 1704, first law enforcement. The first paid law enforcement in what would later become the United States was created in the Carolina colonies as a formal slave patrol. In the North, fear of labor union organizers and Irish, Italian, German, Catholic, and Eastern European immigrants drove a call for law and order. And by the 1880s, every US city had a police force. 1776, the Declaration of Independence. Enslaver and planter Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. The contradiction between espoused equality, the rights of man, and slavery led to stronger scientific and social justifications for racial superiority. 1790, Naturalization Act. Only immigrants who were free white persons of good character could receive citizenship. Without citizenship, non-whites couldn't vote, own property, bring suit, or testify in court. 
1815, Star Spangled Banner. Francis Scott Key, slave owner and lawyer, wrote Star Spangled Banner to celebrate America's victory against the British in the Battle of Fort McHenry. Escaped slaves had fought for Britain in exchange for their freedom. In the unsung fourth verse, he wrote, no refuge could save the hairling and the slave from the terror or flight or gloom of the grave and the star spangled banner and triumph doth wave, decrying the former slaves who had the audacity to fight for their freedom. 116 years later, President Hoover made star spangled banner the United States first official anthem. 1830 to 1887, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act followed by the Dawes Act empowering the federal government to take native held land and forcibly relocate indigenous people from their homes <laughs> reservations. Collectively owned Indian lands were divided into individual and sold a surplus land to whites. By law, Native Americans were not considered citizens and therefore could not own land. Many tribes still occupy these reservations today and have the highest rates of infant mortality, addiction, unemployment, disease, and poverty in the country. 1839, skulls determine human hierarchy. American scientist Samuel Morton claimed that to measure the brain capacity through skull size, but made systematic errors that supported his bias. He concluded that the larger skulls of Caucasians gave them decided and unquestioned superiority over all the nations of the earth. Morton's theories influenced all aspects of society, including national policy. 1845, plantation physician and gynecology. Known today as the father of modern gynecology, James Marion Sims conducted the first successful fistula operation and invented the Sims speculum. Dr. Sims practiced surgical techniques on enslaved African women held in the back of his private hospital. Dr. Sims became famous while the women are known and unnamed except for three, Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy. The doctor reported performing 30 surgeries on Anarka alone, all without anesthesia. He is recognized in countless journals and academic departments with statues honoring him across the United States. 1846 to 1848, a strong believer in manifest destiny, US President James Polk waged the Mexican-American War to seize land from Mexico and expand the nation's boundary. Through this war, the US acquired more than 500,000 square miles of Mexican territory. This graphic depicts the landmass as if the war had never occurred. Created by geographer and historian Donald Menig, it shows the US without the former Mexican land that is now known as the states of Texas, California, Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and Nevada. 1854, non-whites can't testify. In 1854, the California Supreme Court reversed the murder conviction of a white man in the People v. Hall trial, ruling that the testimony of key Chinese witnesses was inadmissible because no black or mulatto person or Indian shall be allowed to give evidence in favor of or against a white man. Today, whites are disproportionately the majority of jurors, especially in murder and high profile cases. And studies have found that in some counties, as many as 80% of African-Americans who qualified for jury service were excluded due to racial bias. 1863, Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which gave way to the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. The amendment abolished slavery with one exception, stating neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment of crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. 1865, Black Codes. When slavery was abolished at the end of the Civil War, Southern states created black codes, laws designed to preserve white supremacy. Codes varied from state to state and prohibited blacks from owning a home, congregating, bearing arms, drinking, and traveling. Many required blacks to continue working for their former enslavers. Those who violated were subjected to fines, arrest, and whippings. 1865, KKK created. Following the widespread emancipation of hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans, the Ku Klux Klan was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee as a social club for former Confederate soldiers intended to uphold racial order. The Klan evolved into a terrorist group. In one year alone, the KKK murdered over 3,000 people to influence the outcome of the 1868 election. Then and now, KKK members have assumed roles in judicial offices, Congress, and police forces around the country. 1877, lynching in America. 
From 1877 to 1950, there were over 4,000 recorded lynchings of African Americans in 20 Southern states. Lynching became an American pastime as white families and mobs would take photos in front of lynched bodies, send postcards, and even mail black body parts such as ears, genitals, and fingers to family and friends as gifts. Lynching was a vicious system of racial control to reestablish white supremacy post-emancipation. 1879, Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Thousands of Native American children were removed from their families by armed police and sent to private and federally funded boarding schools to force assimilation. The first was a Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, where the philosophy of founder Captain Richard Henry Pratt was that all the Indian there is in a, the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. These boarding schools taught trades such as labor for boys and housekeeping for girls and emphasized brutal discipline rather than academics. The schools were also subject to deadly infections and disease between its 1879 founding and 1918 closing. The Carlisle School alone buried nearly 200 children in its cemetery. 1882, Chinese Exclusion Act. Federal law prohibited entry to the US based on ethnicity for the first time. Under the act, very few Chinese could enter the country and those already here had to register and obtain a certificate of residence or face deportation. Upon expiration, the act was reinvented as the Geary Act, which continued to regulate Chinese immigration until the 1920s. Policies surrounding Chinese immigration shaped much of our current immigration system, introducing passports, visas, green cards. 1890, massacre at Wounded Knee. The US Cavalry killed an estimated 300 Sioux Indians, mostly women and children at Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Judging by the slaughter on the battlefield, it was suggested that the soldiers simply went berserk for who could explain such a merciless disregard for life. This was said by Hugh McGinnis, who wrote, I took part in the Wounded Knee Massacre. 1890, Jim Crow. Segregation and disenfranchisement laws were implemented by local governments and reinforced by acts of terror from vigilantes. Named after a popular minstrel character, the Jim Crow system of racial apartheid dominated the American South for over 70 years. Apartheid in South Africa was modeled after this system. 1904, Ota Benga. Ota Benga, a Congolese man was kidnapped and put on display as part of a human zoo at the St. Louis World Fair. In 1906, he was moved to the Bronx Zoo in New York and displayed with monkeys. After 10 years of humiliation and degradation, Oda Banga committed suicide. Human zoos featuring African and Asians were widespread in Europe and America throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, receiving millions of visitors until as late as 1958. 1921, Tulsa Massacre. Greenwood, a prominent black community known as the Black Wall Street was destroyed. A black man rode in an elevator with a white woman and was soon accused of assaulting her. A mob of white men gathered at a local courthouse resulting in the death of 300 people, 1,256 destroyed homes, 8,000 people left homeless and the once flourishing black neighborhood burned to the ground. Eyewitnesses asserted that there were aerial attacks with dynamite dropped on the neighborhood, which would make this the first bombing on US soil. 1924, Johnson Reed Act. The Johnson Reed Act created the first quota system based upon national origin. The act favored immigrants from Northern and Western Europe over the inferior races of Asia and Southern and Eastern Europe. Following the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act and other exclusionary measures, the act captured decades of racialized anti-immigration policy. This explicit preference system continued to shape American demographics and immigration policy up until the 1960s. 1934 to 1968, redlining and the Federal Housing Administration. Following the Great Depression, the Federal Housing Administration was created to resolve the housing crisis. The current American mortgage system was created and for the next 34 years, the Fair Housing Administration used redlining to racially segregate neighborhoods by denying loans to black families while funding resources in white neighborhoods. The FHA policy claimed that incompatible racial groups should not be permitted to live in the same communities. 1937, forced sterilization of Puerto Rican women. After taking control of Puerto Rico in 1898, the United States became focused on population control on the island, particularly how to reduce the working class. 
the passage of Law 116 in 1937 ushered in an era of mass sterilization. A 1965 survey of Puerto Rican residents found that close to one third of all Puerto Rican mothers ages 20 to 49 had been sterilized. A 1968 study revealed that one third of the women did not know the procedure was irreversible. 1942 to 1945, Japanese internment. Two months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Roosevelt mandated the forced relocation of all persons of Japanese ancestry, regardless of citizenship status. For two and a half years, they were stripped of their homes, businesses, and property and imprisoned in internment camps. 117,000 people of Japanese descent were affected, two thirds of whom were native born citizens of the United States. 1944, GI Bill of Rights. Frank, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the GI Bill of Rights, which led to the establishment of the Department of Veteran Affairs and gave funding to veterans for education and housing attainment. The GI Bill adopted the same racial restrictions as the Federal Housing Administration, which substantially contributed to the growth of white suburbs and white wealth and consigned blacks into urban areas and poverty. 1954, Operation Wetback. President Dwight Eisenhower initiated Operation Wetback, which employed military tactics and deported as many as 1.3 million Mexican people, many of whom were US citizens. Although millions of Mexicans had legally entered the US through joint immigration programs in the first half of the 20th century, Eisenhower promoted his campaign by relying on society's fear that Mexicans were criminals who were diseased and taking away scarce jobs. In Chicago alone, three planes a week were filled and flown to Mexico. In Texas, 25% of all people deported were crammed in, onto boats and many were held in custody without food or water and dumped in desert areas where they died of sunstroke, disease, and other causes. 1963, Baptist Church bombing. In an act of terrorism, white supremacists set off a bomb in the predominantly black 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four young girls. Birmingham was nicknamed Bombingham at the time due to the high number of white supremacist bombings bombing attacks. This incident marked the third bombing in 11 days and further fueled the civil rights movement and call for equal treatment of African Americans. 1971 to present, war on drugs. President Nixon officially declared a war on drugs, setting in motion a tough on crime policy agenda that continues today. President Reagan signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which created mandatory minimum penalties for drug offenses. Possession of crack cocaine, a cheaper form of powder cocaine, results in harsher sentences. Blacks are nearly four times more likely to be incarcerated for marijuana-related offenses than whites, despite equal rates of usage. Almost 80% of people serving time for a federal drug offense are Black or Latinx. 1978, Indian Child Welfare Act. The U.S. Congress commissioned a report on the forced removal of Native American children by state child welfare and private adoption agencies. The report revealed that 25 to 35 percent of all Native children were being removed, and of these, 85 percent were placed outside of their families and communities, even when fit and willing relatives were available for the children. The intent of Congress under ICWA was to protect the best interests of Indian children and to promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. Today, Native American children are four times as likely to be taken from their families and placed into foster care than their white counterparts. 1980, mass incarceration. The tough on crime politics of the 1980s and 1990s fueled an explosion in incarceration rates. President Nixon's drug war policy starting in 1971 ensured that Black and Latinx men were disproportionately represented in corrections facilities, receiving hard time for nonviolent crimes. By 2003, the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimated that Black men have a one in three chance of being incarcerated. 2015, police killings of Black people rise. In 2015, more Black people were killed by police than lynched in the peak year of lynchings in the 1800s. This trend led to the creation of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013, which continues to fight against anti-Black racism and police brutality to get today. 2017, Muslim ban. Trump signed Executive Order 13769, protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. 
This executive order halted the nation's refugee program and temporarily suspended all immigration for citizens of seven majority Muslim countries, even though since 9-11, there have been no fatalities in the US caused by extremists from any of the banned countries. The order was seen as religious discrimination by many. Federal and state courts fought to suspend the ruling nationwide. 2017 to 2020, border detention. The Trump administration declared a zero tolerance policy directing that all adult migrants, including those seeking asylum, would be imprisoned and their children taken away and placed in detention centers. The government did not create a tracking system, leaving thousands of children, including infants and toddlers, unable to be reunified with their families. Journalists and visitors reported dangerously overcrowded conditions with children sleeping on concrete floors, filthy water, insufficient food, and lack of bathing facilities. As of 2019, the government had received 178 reports of adult staff sexually assaulting migrant children who were being held in detention. And we still have a long way to go. So we hope you will join us today at 845. We're going to be inviting anybody who wants to come and gather with us and talk about the history of racism, the trauma of racism, and do some healing meditation together. Um, you'll receive um, some information about how to join us at 845. We hope you'll join us. Wow. Thanks, Deborah and Angelica. And I hope that many of you will join us to reflect following this call. That timeline brilliantly shows the intentionality and consequential longevity behind erected systems of racism in America. Further, it helps us to see what being an anti-racist is all about. As Dr. Ibram Kendi reminds us in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, racism is not really about hatred and ignorance so much as it is about structures. Racism directs attention away from harmful, inequity, um, harmful inequitable policies and turns that attention on the people harmed by those policies. And we can't really talk about policies in America without talking about our policymaking system of democracy in America. Which leads me to a new framework I introduced to the democracy movement two years ago called the seven deadly sins of American democracy. Now, the original sins of American democracy, as we saw, were genocide, chattel slavery, and the theft, terror, trauma, subjugation, and exclusion of indigenous and black lives that accompanied it. And before we get into the technical applications, it's important to understand that the original sins are ultimately still running through democracy's veins in America. And it plays out in these very technical ways. But people are quite comfortable with these technical sins because, or at least just as, they were quite comfortable with the original sin. This foundational context is critical to understanding each of the seven deadly sins of America democracy. So here we go. Number one, voter suppression. Broad attempts to systematically discourage or restrict access to registration and voting. Over the years, the restriction of voter participation by elected officials have continuously targeted demographics that stand in opposition to their political agenda. The most impacted and targeted of these victims have been Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Number two, voter erasure or purging. Voter purges are an often flawed process of cleaning up voter rolls by deleting names from registration lists. While updating registration lists as voters die, move, or otherwise become ineligible is necessary and important, when done irresponsibly with bad data or when two voters are confused for the same person, many voters discover they're no longer listed only when they arrive at the polling place. This can be done intentionally and most commonly happens to black and brown Americans who may have common names. A 2019 Brennan Center report found that a staggering 17 million voters were purged between 2016 
and 2018. Number three, felony disenfranchisement. The practice of barring individuals from voting based on prior felony con convictions. These policies often have a disproportionate impact on communities of color who comprise the majority of current criminal justice system population. As of 2016, 6.1 million Americans were kept from voting due to laws that block citizens convicted of felony offenses. Felony offenses, felony disenfranchisement rates vary by state as states institute a wide range of disenfranchisement policies. Number four, the corrupt influence of big money in politics. Having money and rich donors should have no influence on policymaking, but it does. Politicians rely on big money to fund increasingly expensive political campaigns, keeping people of color and low income individuals who have the voice to make necessary change out of the competition. Number five, gerrymandering. Drawing legislative districts to advantage one party or political interests. For example, district lines may be drawn to limit the amount of political voice in an area with high representation of black and brown voters. Corrupt state legislatures use this as an opportunity to increase the likelihood of their candidates being elected to Congress. Number six, vulnerable voting systems and Trojan media. Our elections are susceptible to cyber attacks, malfunctions, manipulation, and ecosystems open to tampering or malfunction can erode public trust in election outcomes and discourage people from voting. Trojan media is when political, politically motivated individuals use social platforms and media to advance a political agenda predicated on misinformation or fake news. In the 2016 election, we saw a dark money funded, we saw dark money funded ads and social media bots specifically target black and brown online communities to keep us from voting. And number seven, the electoral college. If we are to finally fix our democracy, we must finally face the fact that the electoral college is a vestige of our nation's original sin of slavery. According to James Madison, the father of the constitution, it was a compromise, quote, principally forged not to protect small states, but rather to incentivize slaveholding states to sign the constitution. Not only was the electoral college predicated on the abominable three-fifths compromise, which partially counted non-voting slaves or three-fifths of all enslaved Africans to boost congressional districts and therefore electors each state ended up with, but to this day, it violates the constitutional principle of one person, one vote, signaling that some states and votes are less important than others. So again, number one, voter suppression, number two, voter erasure or purges, uh, number three, felony disenfranchisement, number four, the corrupt influence of big money in politics, number five, gerrymandering, number six, vulnerable voting systems and Trojan media, and number seven, the Electoral College. Transparency International Project on Government Oversight and Policy Link commissioned a white paper on this, but this is just, to, uh, just meant to be an introduction. So stay tuned to the Represent Us and Policy Link websites in the coming days for what will be a living document and scorecard on the state of our democracy. That said, it's important to note that we definitely move towards a more equal democracy with the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts during the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. But even that progress has been undermined as we saw by mass incarceration and the anti-democracy decade that started with the Supreme Court's 2010 Citizens United decision and continued with its 2013 Shelby versus Holder decision, which gutted the Voting Rights Act and made my generation the first to witness America become less democratic. So to borrow from my good friend, Francis Moore LePay, in order to save the democracy we thought we had, we must now take it where it's never been. And that's a good point to introduce tonight's all-star panel. While the scale of the problem is daunting, we are very fortunate to have incredible individuals doing the work to unrig the system. I'm about to welcome today's panelists, but before I do, I'm thrilled to bring to our virtual stage, our first performer, 
You may know her as part of Beyonce's all-female touring band, the Sugar Mamas. Please welcome Grammy-nominated artist, composer, and musician, Divinity Rocks. Good evening, my name is Divinity Rocks. I am so honored to be here at the Unlock Your Power to Unrig the System Roundtable. I'm here on behalf of Songs for Good, a songwriting competition. And I entered my song into this competition and I'm one of the finalists and I'm super excited about that. I'm here to share my song with you, We Are. It's so easy to feel powerless right now. It's what's so great about the name of this summit, Unlock Your Power, it's so easy to feel powerless. But we mustn't forget that we are the ones we've been waiting for. <laughs> What's the color of love? Greens and yellows, hues of blues, the world is yours. This is the feeling we give and we know that we're floating above. My heart is pounding with passion and beat. Can you feel it in yours? Can you feel it in yours? The future's in my hands. If I poured it into love, ain't no telling what I'ma get back if I'm gonna get it back. Can you feel the buzz? Who am I to judge? I only come from love. We are traveling now at the speed of light. Can't you feel the rush? Will love really conquer all? Is a gun really worth the fall? Are we all so afraid of what we don't understand that we're willing to shoot without cause? What if you were that one? Who could change the course? Would you step into your greatness? Would you? Can you feel the force? We are, we are, we are what we're waiting for. Put your hands in the sky and reach for the stars. We are, we are, we are what we're waiting for. Put your hands in the sky. Is the limit let's fly through the limit my feet are on the ceiling so of course i'm feeling lifted my head is in the clouds i can't feel the ground i was racing through the past but the future's here right now right now one be one heart one life one love one of you plus one of me it was one way before long before long my heart is pounding with passion and beat can you feel it in yours can you feel it in yours will love really conquer all is a gun really worth the fall? Are we all so afraid of what we don't understand that we're willing to shoot without cause? What if you were that one who could change the course? Would you step into your greatness? Would you? Can you feel the force? We are, we are, we are what we're waiting for. Put your hands in the sky and reach for the stars. We are. Divinity, and what an insp inspirational note to begin today's panel conversation on. Tonight's panel conversation brings together art and activism, Republicans and progressives, and democracy reformers and racial justice advocates. We're going to keep our conversation fast paced and lively and I've asked the panelists to keep their answers to less than one minute per round. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel. We've got an incredible group here. First, there's Grace Martinez Rosas. Grace is the executive director of United We Dream, the largest immigrant youth-led network in the country with over 800,000 members. We also have two Michaels joining us tonight. There's Michael K. Williams, actor and activist Michael K. Williams. You may know him from The Wire and now Lovecraft Country. 
He also collaborates with Crew Count to create more just and equitable communities through youth engagement. Then there's Michael Steele, former RNC chairman and MSNBC political analyst, Michael Steele. He made history as the first African-American elected to statewide office when he was elected Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor of Maryland in 2003. And finally, we have Nalini Stamp, Director of Strategy and Partnerships for the Working Families Party, leading the way to transform grassroots energy into voter turnout. Welcome speakers. I'm going to ask all four panelists to answer the same first question to kick us off. We have a lot to get through, so I'll ask that we each keep our answers to under one minute. So the first question again is to all of you and I'll start with uh, Grace. How are racial justice and democracy connected? Or how does your work connect democracy and racial justice? Grace, starting with you. Wow, that's not an easy question, but I'm gonna to try to get at it. <laughs> My name is Grace Martinez Rosas. I am undocumented, unafraid, queer, and unashamed. And I'm honored to represent United We Dream as the largest immigrant youth-led network in the country. You know, what we do at United We Dream is, is this idea of transformation. We believe that those closest to the pain are also closest to the solutions, the innovations, and the breakthroughs. And what could be more democratic than that? The idea that those that are directly impacted by any system should have a voice and being able to shape it. And so at UWD, we really believe that our immigrant justice system is also part of a broader conversation about racial justice. And so um, the work that we do every day where young people are making calls for folks to get activated, where people are coming out as undocumented and unafraid, um, all of those things are serving to ensure that we are building the next generation of freedom fighters, of elected officials, of people that are running events just like this. And I'm really honored to be able to be um, on this call with all of you and to continue to do this work of this experiment of a democracy. Thank you, Grace. Uh, Michael Steele, same question. How are racial justice and democracy connected? Well, given the, uh, first off, it's great to be with everybody. Uh, very, very honored uh, to be here. But given the history of the country, um, this idea of its founding, the fact that even before those moments, uh, this country was uh, on the pathway of confronting race injustice, uh, starting in 1619, uh, speaks to what is once at once an ideal of who we are and what we profess. Um, and then there's the reality. Uh, and while we understand and appreciate that history, what I, what I so much more appreciate about this moment is that this generation uh, of, of activists, uh, engaged citizens, have an opportunity to bring to fruition the promise, um, acknowledging uh, the past, acknowledging the, the struggle, acknowledging the difficulties, but ringing that bell for the promise and, and, and holding the nation accountable to that promise in a way that has never been held accountable before. Um, so this idea, these twin pillars of, of our democracy and justice are balanced by the notion of equality. Uh, and, and that is the space that really defines how all of this works. If I do not see uh, Michael or Gracia or anyone as equal to me, not by status, not by anything other than the fact that you are a citizen in this country, baby, and we love each other accordingly, then you've un unleveled the playing field for everyone. So that, that, those ideas and that ideal do matter in this moment of democracy and justice that are held together by this sense of equality. Thank you, Michael Steele. Michael K. Williams, same question to you. How are racial justice and democracy connected? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, and I really appreciated the timeline that was presented. Um, it was impactful. Uh, I'm still digesting um, the feelings that I, I got from hearing that all collectively, you know, in, in one one collective piece of information. Uh, for me, I, I, I am on the lines with Gracia. I decided to use my platform to tell 
narratives from my community and to bring empathy and compassion to the experience of what it is to be black and to live in poverty or to, or to be from the hood, as, as we say. Um, I've also decided to use my, my platform to, to show what sexuality looks like in my community. Um, a, few, a huge part of my characters, of my, my, rep, my resume have been gay or bisexual or just, just conflicted on so many different levels. And, um, you know, I, I to, to me, the, the democracy begins with how we, we, we see ourselves and how we allow other people to see us. And um, me as an actor, I, I have a responsibility to not allow people that don't come from my community to stereotype the experience. Um, uh, you know, uh, they to, 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 to look at us as individuals, even though we come from the same community, we may have the same similar situations. You, you, you know, I cannot allow um, the experience of what I do as an actor to, to allow people to, to, to generalize that experience. And, you know, that's just the, that's just me using my platform and that's what it means to me. Thank you, Michael. And Nalini? Hey, everybody. It's, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Nalini. Um, I'm from the People's Republic of Brooklyn. Um, and I am very, um, and I am the proud director of strategy and partnerships with the Working Families Party. And our work is centered on democracy. Um, we are a political organization that is fighting for the many and not just the wealthy few. Um, and that centers when, when we, that slideshow, that, that history timeline also really resonated with me because the founding of this country, it was, it was slave owners that founded democracy for themselves and not for everyone, unfortunately. Although the vision, I think in words were for everyone and people were able to change over time things using those founding documents and using the vision. The vision wasn't complete then and it's still not complete now. And so we fight every day to make sure that working class people, um, black and brown people, indigenous people, LGBTQ people, undocumented people actually have a political power and a voice um, because our communities have not had that political power in a really long time. And so it, that is the intersection of our work and, 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 and democracy is, if we are talking about the United States is the greatest democracy, we have to talk about who founded it. So I really appreciate the grounding of that timeline. And it's sad that we're still here today, but um, you know, we're gonna make good trouble and we're gonna change it. <laughs> Thank you, Nalini. I think everyone is seeing now why this is such an all-star panel. And it's not just because Michael K. Williams is on it. <laughs> <laughs> with, with preference to Grace. Well, Michael Steele. <laughs> <laughs> So I got to kick it to Grace because she has to unfortunately drop early. She can't be two places at once. She is like superwoman. Uh, but uh, uh, Grace, uh, uh, when it comes to certain events or people past or present, what about the American story inspires your own? Um, when I think about this moment, I think about um, how lucky I am to be part of the American through line. It's the through line that goes uh, uh, along uh, all of those students that took up at the lunch counter um, a protest, all of those people like Carmelita, who was a bracero and a woman that came to the US from Mexico to farm work and refused to be showered with this uh, gases that would be uh, that would that would be showered to Mexican immigrants. And she said she started the bath riots. It's the same through line that we're seeing of sunrise uh, movement and young people of color like demanding change in our climate. Um, and and this is what we're seeing with like black leadership, black Nalini's, like the people on this call and being able to like demand exactly what should be like the bottom line, which is that black lives matter. Black lives matter to me, that black lives matter to our democracy. And until black lives matter to all of us, we will not be able to make um, this democracy the democracy that we all deserve. And so as an undocumented woman, as a queer woman, I am committed to ensuring that this country not only embraces undocumented people, not only are we able to talk about the forced sterilization of women um, in detention centers right now, but that we are able to tell a story that ensures that all of us, Black, brown, white, 
all of us are able to live with dignity, to be able to walk the streets without fear and ultimately be able to breathe. We just want to breathe with some dignity. And that's the, that's the project that I am in. That's why United We Dream exists. And that's why we need to build independent political power that is accountable to the people. And I'm excited to do that with all of you tonight. Wow, wow, wow. And Grace, before you have to drop, is there a connection to your mind between jails, detention centers, and voter purges? Absolutely. Uh, we, we know that the same people that want to have undocumented people in detention centers. Yesterday, we just um, mourned the loss of another man that died in detention in Georgia by, because he had COVID. Um, it is the same story that we're seeing with, uh, with people all across the country, in particular Black and Latinx men that are, and women that are put into these jails. And the biggest connector here is profit. People are profiting off of the bodies of black and brown folks in detention. And so this country has a reckoning to do. And also I am excited to ensure that we are uh, being able to not only talk about the things that are not working, but also build up the things that have worked for all of us. So there's absolutely a connection. And I see a future for all of us where all of us are able to have access to education, healthcare, are able to not worry about those bills that all of us have and that have the ability to, again, to live with dignity, thrive and being able to breathe. What about the census? How is the fight for racial justice and democracy showing up in unique ways for the Latinx community, the census spe specifically? I mean, I think part of the, the slides that we saw at the beginning talk, and you talked about the seven deadly sins that when we talk about redistricting, that is absolutely at the core of what's happening with the census. You are seeing that undocumented people are really afraid of opening the door to the enumerators because we know what's happening in the streets when ICE and CBP are coming to rip us away from our families. And so the census, um, we are running a campaign to ensure that everyone, all of us are counted and we must ensure that we are creating the right conditions, both politically and culturally, to ensure that everybody has the right to be counted. Um, and the census is at the core of that. And I think that you know the work that uh, Working Families Party and many others are doing are possible, are, are making that much more possible for all of us. Wow. It is so difficult to say goodbye or see you later to you right now because you just grounded this whole conversation. I'm sure all the panelists can agree. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Michael Steele, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> speak, speaking of American history and identity, Michael, you refer to yourself as a Lincoln Republican. Yeah. Why is it so important that the Republican Party doesn't lose sight of the same big tent and anti-disenfranchisement principles that led it to abolished slavery with Lincoln, right. passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and reauthorized the 1965 Voting Rights Act under Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Bush. Yeah, it, it, it's still rather stunning to me uh, that in so many ways, uh, the party has allowed itself to drift um, into, its, uh, into this underbelly uh, of our democracy and, and un an underbelly that quite honestly um, is not reflective of the progress that we've made and, and, and the efforts that still lie before us. So when I look at the history and I look at the founding of the party, um, you know, that was one of the things that animated me. I, I recognized you know, the, historically, this is, this is the political home of African-Americans. This is where we found our political voice um, through the abolitionist movement, uh, through the Underground Railroad, through leaders like uh, Frederick Douglass and others um, who had that unprecedented access at that time to the president of the United States, uh, to leaders in Congress uh, that led to uh, African Americans being elected to the United States Senate from the South in, during Reconstruction and members of Congress. Um, and to forget that history and why that tent was built the way it was, to me was so disconcerting, which is why in, when I became national chairman, I declared very emphatically that this whole Southern strategy that relates back to the 1960s, particularly 64 after the Goldwater loss, embraced by Nixon in, in the 68 campaign of welcoming white segregationists into the party um, for the political benefit of winning national elections, 
that we weren't doing that anymore, that our future didn't lie there. It didn't lie with segregationist white men. It, it, the future lay in the hands of the people of this, on this panel. The future laid in communities across this country that look like me, that look like you, uh, that speak different languages, that have different experiences, but reflect that American, that unique Americanness and that unique American pride. So for me, that was important. It was galvanizing. It was something I tried to do as national chairman to expand those opportunities and that conversation to go into, into neighborhoods and communities where typically we weren't welcome and to have conversations with people like uh, Al Sharpton um, and going before the National Action Network and spending time with Jesse, to spending time with the Urban League, talking to the leaders in the black community about how these synergies can come together around some big ideas that we would like to share with the, with the black community and with Hispanic community. That all went away when Trump came down the escalator and, and basically said what he said about his view of America, that we build walls, that we uh, try to keep people out. And that was antithetical to where the party I thought needed to go. And it's now part of the national discussion, not just about the GOP, about the country as a whole, what is the path we need to take and who do we uh, welcome along the way? I contend it's not just white men. Um, in fact, it's, it's those of us in this conference, in this conversation, because this is the future. Um, and, and I think the rest of America has to reconcile itself to that. And I'm ready to help them do that. Well, I, I wanna actually get your opinion here on voting rights coming from what uh, we might call the grass top side. Mm -hmm. uh, you served as the chair of the Republican National Committee, uh, held post on the National Federal Election Reform Commission and NAACP Blue Ribbon Commission on elect Election Reform. Uh, and you now serve as chair of the U.S. Vote Foundation. So you seem to get it, but <laughs> what would your message be to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who since last year has unilaterally blocked the Voting Rights Advancement Act and other pro-democracy legislation that, again, previously enjoyed bipartisan support? Well, he's wrong. He's wrong, and he should be ashamed. Uh, th this is not about politics. This is about doing what's right. In fact, I've uh, advocated that the Voting Rights Act be applied not just to those states that are encompassed by the act, but to all 50 states and all the territories of the United States. Every state should be held accountable to make sure that it is respecting the rights guaranteed in the Constitution to every person uh, in this country. So. That's step one for me. You're wrong, Mitch McConnell, to, to put that bill in the drawer of the US Senate. Take it out, put it on the floor, have the debate, and give it to Trump to sign it. Because that, that will say more to America about what you believe and what you value about the country than anything else. The fact that you don't do that says something too. So for me, this space has always been important because it is the most important thing we have as citizens, um, is the ability to shape this government. Our founders made it very clear. We the people are the government. We the people form the more perfect union, right? That's our struggle. That's our, our effort every day. And to the extent that we do that, it is based fundamentally in our ability to vote. And when you take that away, you disenfranchise the democracy. You, you break up the republic. Uh, and that's not what the founders had in mind. And yes, well, I understand it was basically for white gentrified men who could do it then. But that was then, baby. We're talking now. We have this, uh, this opportunity and this control. And that's why what you do this November matters so much. Um, if you don't do anything between now and then, register and get engaged and exercise that franchise. Wow, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a few of those lines end up uh, on some mainstream media <laughs> show uh, tonight or tomorrow. But uh, that said, I wanna to turn to the other Michael. Now, Michael Williams, you're here tonight as both an actor and an activist. Dr. King, Harry Belafonte, and Paul Robeson before them saw art and activism as inextricably linked and celebrities as potential cultural ambassadors grounded in the great causes and movements of their time. 
Can you tell us more about the work you do to honor this Belafonte Robeson tradition? What roles have you taken to elevate the issues important to you on and off the screen? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for even calling my name with the likes of those, those greats, the people that I, I consider mentors. Um, um, Nina Simone once said that it, uh, uh, it is an artist's duty to reflect the times in which uh, we find ourselves in. And um, for me, that never, that didn't, that, that landed home for, for real, for real with the, uh, when they see us, the, the Netflix uh, uh, miniseries, when they see us, that, that was, um, that, that encompassed everything that, that you speak of. Um, when you asked me, what, how did I use, what roles did I take to show in just or how how badly things were 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 afraid. Um, I, however, you, you know, on a personal level, um, I you know I, I I find myself getting very discouraged and powerless when we speak about um, situations that are put in place by men like uh, Mr. McDonald, uh, uh, Mitch McDonald. I, I you know. Um, I believe that it would take an act of God to soften uh, his heart. And so I tend to not put my energy there. Um, um, what, when you say the government, we the people are the government, um, what that means to me now is engaging our youth, our young people. I no longer call them kids. I call them the next future leaders. And I speak to them, I ask them, you know, the work that I do with Dana Racklin at NYC Together is we encourage them to come up with ideas and solutions and campaigns around public safety and policy and what, what does good policy look like in that community. And I, I, I you know, um, and I agree with Michael, what we do in this November by getting registered and voting is very important. Um, however, the work that I've been doing in, in the communities, particularly in Brownsville, Brooklyn, um, the youth are, are so discouraged with the voting process. Um, you know, there's still a lot of adults that don't believe in this largely. I've had debates, you know, with, with grown men and, and, you know, their, their responses, you know, that electoral college, you know, talk to me when you can explain that. Right. And, and, you know, I don't know what to say. I'm not a politician, uh, nor do I, I, I care to be. Um, so for me, it is about, I, I found that my power is uh, being involved in local legislation and, and, and who are running for those local offices, who is our, who is our council members, who are, who are our district leaders, our borough leaders um, in regards to New York City, where I, I still live. And finding out who those people are, finding out what their policies are. And when I talk to the young people in, in, in my community, it is important that I in, in, in educate them as I am getting educated myself. Um, a lot of this information is, is um, I'm still being downloaded and being educated and informed and awakened. So, um, it, it, you know, I believe that if we, if we show our young people, how this works, you know, that the, 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 the elect the, uh, of executive offices, the elections, they are very important, which is coming up right now, you know, the, the presidential, the mayor, the governor, they're important, but man, the ones that happen between those elections are vital. You know, um, I remember, um, and I'll bring this back to myself, an experience that I had that I, I never want to feel again was um, I look back at the Obama administration and who I was in 2008. I was, you know, I was the party guy, you know, the president black, hey, you know, I was just, I was a party for me. I was just like, you know, kumbaya, <laughs> everything is great, you know, and you know, we, you know, yes we can, and yes, you know, yes we did, you know, I was that guy. <laughs> and then, you know, when this man, got on his hands and knees and begged us 
to come out and support him in that midterm election with the uh, the um with the state house and the senate is voted on. I, I missed that memo. I was too busy partying because I had a black president, right? And what happened was I allowed I allowed him to be handcuffed. And part of the reason why, you know, um, the, you know, I am part of the reason why we lost the Senate because I did not get that memo. I did not get out and make my voice count because I didn't realize the importance of that. That's not um, my community is not educated on that part of the process. We're only told, we only get the every four years, the get out and vote hammer beat across our heads. And we're not told, um, we're not educated enough as to who to believe in and to, and, and how to get, and how to make our power count on a local level. So that has been um, a lot of the work that I've been doing with my nephew, Dominic Dupont and Dana Racklin in, in the community of Brooklyn in regards to how we get kids or excuse me, our young leaders to feel empowered is by educating them so that we don't even have to use the sentence, get registered and vote. They will have enough understanding that the logical next step would be to do that. Like they will be like, oh, I know what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna get registered and I'm gonna vote because I know who I wanna put my, my, my power behind locally, you know? And so um, that's pretty much what, what, I've been, what I've been doing with, my, with, uh, with the youth and the work I've been doing in the community. Thank you, Michael. Now, uh, I want to zoom out a bit uh, to the big picture. Nalini, um, working families party sees the common denominator, blocking everything from sensible environmental reform to criminal justice reform as corruption, uh, specifically the corrupt influence of big money in politics. Can you talk about WFP's new justice fund that speaks directly to this phenomenon and pivotal moment in history? Absolutely, and it's uh, great to be on this conversation um, with all of you and an old, old, old friend who knew me as a baby, um, <laughs> Michael. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, in terms of corruption and de democracy reform are, are, are essential um, because we, like people have influence over voting. So when we see things that are happening, particularly like the wildfires in California, and we know that big oil and gas companies are paying <laughs> um, to continue to de destroy our environment. Um, this, is, this, this goes hand in hand. Corruption is because we cannot have, um, we shouldn't have uh, members of Congress be able to be lo lobbyists two years after they get an office, right? We, we need to have a separation. And, and unfortunately, when Citizens United happened, it allowed to say that corporations were equal to people. And in this country, if we're really thinking about one person, one vote, we have to have that. And you know, we, so we launched, um, given the, 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 the big um, stuff that was happening in the streets this year, I was out in New York every day I occupied. We had an occupation outside of City Hall that lasted for a month. I got beat, the, the worst I've got, and I was part of Occupy Wall Street. I've got, I got the beat, the worst part, Ronaldo, you've, you've seen me get arrested many times. And the worst, the worst th that was the worst in, in June. And it was because we were saying defund the police. And there is one of the, the reasons why the movement was rallying around this, because what do we actually, it's not just about defund, it's what do we need to invest in. Yes. We can go back to the founding of slave patrols and, and how that led to the modern day policing, but it's also, we have to invest in education. We have to invest in job programs for our youth in the city yes. of New York and in cities across the country. We have to invest in language justice and I could just go on and on and on. But it, so, and what happens when, a, what happens when a budget, because a budget expresses your moral values. When a police budget balloons, while they cut education, you are saying that you care more about incarcerating our people than educating our people. Yes. And so the Movement for Black Lives Electoral Justice Project and the Working Families Party, we lost, we launched the WFP Justice Fund, which is a commitment to support down ballot candidates because it's, um, as Michael said, it's important about midterms, but also your city, your school board, your mayor, those are yes. critical because they decide the, the public advocate. of your day-to-day -day lives, the public advocate, all of the things. And we've been 
proud to do down ballot races. We, you know, Jumani Williams is one of the folks yes, who is yes. the public advocate of the city of New York is my dear friend. We yep. campaign for him, you know, in the streets all the time. And so it's power in the streets and power in city hall. And so we need to make sure um, that th the reason why, and the justice fund says three things. We want candidates to be bold and we want them to be nominated by their communities. Two, we want them to, to commit to not taking money from police unions because police unions use their influence, they have used their influence and have unfortunately turned into agents of white supremacy when they dox the child of the mayor of the city of New York and put her in danger as a young black woman because um, she was prote protesting one day when they actually released her personal information. These are no longer folks who wanna keep us safe. These are folks who are becoming agents of white supremacy and they use their money and their influence over folks just like gas companies and oil companies use their money, just like we see um, you know, corporations use their money and they use it as influence. And so our justice fund, you can go to wfpjusticefund.org to get involved because we're gonna commit to making sure that down ballot candidates next year, especially when we have a lot of city councils up across the country, that we have people who really we want to re represent our value of big folk. Wow. If, if, I, if I could just, sir, if I could just piggyback on what, what the sister said, just really, if not, I won't, but if I just really quickly, because um, she said something, she hit a really hot button, if that's okay. Really quick, really quick, guys, we got to turn to Q&A, but oh. go ahead. Uh, okay, it, it, you know, um, she, she mentioned the, the D word, you know, defund, right? And and I, I'm, I am pro defund as well, too, but, you know, I've also learned that maybe a better word we could use is reallocate, right? Um, I watched the news tonight and um, this is a white woman. She, re she called 911 because she had a 13 year old son who she repeatedly told them on the call was having a mental issue, right? That boy got yep. shot repeatedly in his back. That happened, what, yesterday or this evening, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And this is a white woman that, that I believe a woman, a, a white woman did. So, you know, when we, like the sister said, re reallocate some of the funds. I'm, when we say defund, I'm not saying get rid of the police department. Lord knows we need good police. However, should we be calling the police for our mentally ill um, 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 family members? No. Should we be calling police because our, you know, my kid is smoking a little weed in the hallway or my daughter and her girlfriends are playing Beyonce songs. They're practicing Beyonce steps in the, in the hallway a little too loud. No, though, you know, those are, are quality of life issues that people in the community are they, they have they are prepared and they speak the vernacular to deal with that. My mother always said prevention is better than cure. Even in regards to the gang violence, there are people from the a formerly incarcerated community that speak the language, that have the training, that know how to get into those situations and diffuse it before it becomes a crime. All we're saying to the police department when we say defund is let us help you because obviously it's too much on your plate. It's not fair to the police department to expect them to be able to uh, uh, guidance counselors, uh, 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 mental doctor, mental health doctors and, and, and crime fighters. It's not fair to them. Let us help you, but give us the resources and the finances that people can create opportunities and jobs and, and we can really go into our community and, and, and do for ourselves a little bit. That's, that's where I believe, that's the definition for me behind defund. I just want to just piggyback on what the said. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Well, fortunately, we're actually out of time and we've got so much more questions, many more questions to ask. I could do this for at least another 30 minutes or so. We've got to turn to Q&A, however, but I've got to ask Michael Steele when we talk about democracy reforms. Last on my list of the seven deadly sins of American democracy is the electoral college. This is often framed in a left versus right context, but you are a supporter of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So why do you believe that Republicans should also get behind reforming the Electoral College as quick as you can? Well, just very quickly, just so folks know what that is, the National Popular Vote uh, Election Reform is all about creating a, a compact among the states, very much like our lottery. The states agree that to participate in the lottery, so New York, Washington, Delaware, New Jersey, we all agree to you know, play Powerball. Um, and so we agree here in Maryland that the winner in New York gets paid with the money that's, you know, put into the coffer from Maryland, from the citizens who participate in Maryland. Similarly, that's what we're talking about here with the national popular vote. 
that you have an opportunity among the states to come together and say collectively, those states totaling 270 electoral votes agree that the winner of the national popular vote get the electoral votes of their states. Right now, as we speak, we're 74 electoral votes away from having that interstate compact in effect. Now, unfortunately, we are past the, the trigger period for this cycle in 2020. Um, but by 2024, we really believe that for the first time in our history, the American people will be, be able to uh, elect the president, the next president of the United States by direct election, meaning by popular vote. Republicans need to get behind that because the demographics are changing. Uh, the country is changing. And the reality of it is you just can't rely on this old strategy, which was referred to before, where you go to these battleground states uh, and, and you try to carve out and eke out a win while ignoring urban populations, while ignoring uh, you know, parts of the country that don't look like you or believe what you believe. Uh, under this new formula, every vote matters, every state matters. So Republican has to go to California and has to go to uh, Arizona and, and, and Washington state why? Because it's got to mine those votes to get to that national popular vote total. Similarly, Democrats have to go to red states. They'll have to go into Arkansas and Alabama and Mississippi to mine those votes to get to that national total. So this is a reform that we're very excited about and hope uh, uh, people check it out and, and learn a little bit more about it. And uh, as we get into the state legislative processes beginning next year, uh, we're going to work to get those 74 electoral votes. So 2024, you get to vote for the president directly. Thanks, Chairman Steele. Okay, last question to all of you. In one sentence, in this moment, what gives you hope? Oh. Start with you, Nalini. Um, what gives me hope is the people who have been in the streets, who have been support, a few things. The people who have been caring for each other in this country, meaning everyone from our frontline workers, who are nurses, grocery store workers, postal workers, who are caring for one another and showing up for one another. Our communities providing mutual aid when our government failed during this pandemic. Um, and everybody who, because of their love for black life, took to the street took to the streets and said enough is enough oh. and are still a hundred plus days are still crying for justice for Breonna Taylor, are still crying for justice for all of these people and not just for folks, but so that we can transform our country. To, so for all of you who have been calling your senators, being in the streets, participating, that is what we want. That is what our, if people have told me since I was a kid, we want you to participate in this country. And so everybody who is doing that from from you TikTokers that I don't understand TikTok to the folks <laughs> who are actually out in the streets. Thank you. You all give me hope for the future that we will save this planet and we will actually get the country that we deserve. Wow. Michael Steele, what gives you hope? One sentence. One sentence, uh, we the people. There's Ooh. not, we the people, there's nothing more profound or more important. Every, everything keys off of that. If we don't get that, we will not uh, get the government. We won't get the country. We won't get the planet that we want. So um, we have to step up our game, folks. You can't sleep on this one. You can't stay away from what you're being called to do as citizens. Because uh, if you don't, I don't want to hear you bitching come 2021. Uh, I don't want to hear you complain and come to 2021. And I don't want the excuse making that I heard after 2016 that, oh, I, I thought Hillary's going to win. I don't want to hear, <laughs> oh, I thought Biden was going to win. Get up off your butt and do what Michael has talked about. Do what Nalini's talked about do what you're here to do, period. This is, this is, this is not a, a moment for weak knees, folks. Get in the game. Thank you, Michael K. Williams, one sentence, hope. Um, recently, what has given me hope is the, um, the work that I've been doing in New York City has exposed me and given me privilege to be around uh, the, the NYPD. And I, I gotta say, man, um, unfortunately, good police doesn't really sell newspapers, but um, 
with the the men and women, and particularly uh, the uh, the the officers of color that I've been exposed to and I've been working with, and in, in particularly in Brooklyn, um, they give me hope. You, you know, it's very easy for the media and what we see to for me to feel that it's us to make me feel like it's us against them. Um, and we all know that that won't work. And in fact, that'll fail miserably. Um, community safety is a collaborative effort. And I've had the privilege of being, um, of meeting and getting the opportunity to work with and walk the streets in the community, particularly of Brownsville with some really good police that care. And um, I, I can say that I have police officers that I call my brothers. I can pick up the phone and call them if I, God forbid, if I'm in need. and. Um, that gives me hope. Thank you. Well, actually, as we turn, I, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and thank you, Nalini. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we wanted to turn the Q&A, but as I look at all of the questions here, there's some common themes. A lot of it has actually already been answered by the time we got to the end. Um, I will ask uh, Nalini, since I see some common themes here around ranked choice voting, um, I know that, um, uh, Work and Families Party uh, endorsed ranked choice voting as a ballot reform in New York City last year. Is this th democracy reform also connected to racial justice? Same question uh, for New York's landmark small dollar public matching funds program. And has this campaign finance reform resulted in greater diversity and representation in New York? Absolutely. I mean, for our campaign finance system, which is public fin matching system in the city of New York has allowed candidates like Jumani Williams, who grew up in public housing in Flatbush and who, who was able to be a housing organizer, fought for his community and is now the public advocate of the city of New York. Um, when you have public matching, that means that if, you were, if you're coming from a, a low income background or you come from a background where you don't have lots of dollars to reach out to, the city publicly matches you because we should be doing that. We should have folks like my aunt who was a medical technician for years and an 1199 union member and she should have ran for office because she knows about healthcare and all of these things. Those folks should have those opportunities. And ranked choice voting also opens the door because it gives you a choice to rank your people. You can actually rank your people by you know one to five, however many candidates. And instead of just choosing one, you can rank them. So if the first, your top choice doesn't make it through, you are voting for the other choices. And that makes it more fair because you're giving yourself a say in the full process. Instead of just, I'm just checking off one person, that's it, I got nothing else to do. So ranked, we're really excited that next year is the first year and we have a, a, a like 30 seats up in the city council. I'm really excited. We just started our candidate interviews in New York for it. But I'm, and to have them on our ballot line, but I'm really, really excited. And there's a generation of black and brown women and queer folks who are running for office, working class folks who are running for office in the city of New York. And they're gonna be able to do that because they have public financing matching and ranked choice voting. So instead of just getting cut out from the door, they get to actually take it all the way, put their vision out there and New Yorkers get to decide. Yes. Wow. Uh, that, <laughs> that brings us to the end of our time, panelists. Uh, big thank you to all of our panelists. We are so grateful and to our audience for all of your questions tonight. But the night is not over. We're about to hear from Omar Epps and Desmond Mead. But first, a performance by Eric Hu, a music and comedy genius who has taken TikTok by storm with over 700,000 followers. I think you'll understand why after you hear him, Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to perform my song, Stand Up. I'm super excited and grateful for this opportunity. The song is about standing up for what you believe in, standing up for what's right, and not focusing on the negatives of this world. Hope you guys enjoy. This is Stand Up. We will take no more. We will end this war. We will rearrange. We will
will make a change. Stand up, let's make it through. Stand up, just me and you. Stand up, the things we'll do. Trust me, it starts with you. Stand up, let's make it through. Stand up, just me and you. Stand up, the things we'll do. Trust me, it starts with you. You, 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 you. We will make our mark, shine our light in the dark. We will set the price. We will save our lives. You can't stop us. We don't give up. You can't stop us. We won't give up. Stand up, let's make it through. Stand up, just me and you. Stand up, the things we'll do. Trust me, it starts with you. Stand up, let's make it through. Stand up, just me and you. Stand up, the things we'll do. Trust me, it starts with you. You, 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 it starts with you. Wow, thank you, Eric. I'm just loving the grassroots feel of all of these songs coming through and these uh, activists uh, from the ground up. I just love it. What a moving performance. Thank you for lending your voice to this movement. And now it's my pleasure to introduce actor and represent us cultural council member Omar Epps, known for his work in love and basketball, house, uh, among other, uh, so many other credits. Um, and also president and executive director of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition and represent us board member Desmond Mead. Desmond led the FRRC to a historic victory in 2018 uh, with the successful passage of Amendment 4, a grassroots citizens initiative, which restored voting rights to over 1.4 million Floridians with past felony convictions. Amendment 4 represented the single largest expansion of voting rights in the United States in half a century and brought to an end, uh, brought an end to 150 years of a Jim Crow era law in Florida. This past year, Omar and Desmond started together in a, a start together in a short film, Unbreaking America, Justice for Sale, on how our broken political system makes the problems of our criminal justice system worse. Omar, Desmond, take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Omar Epps. Uh, I'm an actor, uh, writer, artist, and uh, I'm passionate about this movement, um, being a black man in America, you know, uh, I, and coming from where I come from, I come from Brooklyn, New York, born and raised. And, um, you know, criminal justice reform is, is a passion point for me. I think that it's interesting as I've gotten older, uh, it, 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 it really, our democracy doesn't work if the criminal justice system isn't working. And we have an antiquated system and you know, for a person like Desmond to have come from where he comes from and accomplish what he's accomplished, I think is magnificent. And so we just have to, you know, keep our, 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 our the pedal to the metal, as they say. Um, Des, you've done some in, incredible work. You know, we've we've worked together before, and I'm just so uh, proud to 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 lend my voice to this movement and and to you know march beside you. Um, so, you know, how, how did you get into this? Like, what's your story? What brought you to this point in your life? Wow. Well, first of all, Omar, um, and it's great seeing you again, my brother. Um, and I, I'm very appreciative of your commitment uh, to really shedding the light on the need to really dismantle this current criminal justice system. You know, my story comes out of that. You know, um, I start my story back in August of 2005 when, you know, I found myself standing in front of railroad tracks waiting on a train to come so I can jump in front of it. You know, at that time I, I was homeless. I was addicted to drugs. I was recently released from prison and I didn't see any kind of light at the end of the tunnel and I was ready to check out. You know? I know my parents didn't raise me to be there, but there I was. And, you know, I, you know, I was just done with life and, 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 and I didn't see any like self-worth, but God had other plans, man. And um, the train didn't come for some reason. 
And I ended up crossing those tracks and I walked a couple blocks further, checked myself into drug treatment. And then after completing drug treatment, I moved into a homeless shelter. And while at the homeless shelter, you know, I wanted to do something so I wouldn't use drugs again because I was tired of being caught up in that vicious cycle uh, of drug abuse where you stop and your life starts to improve and then something happens to trigger uh, a relapse and you're like right back where you started or even the worst place. And so I enrolled at the local community college there and um, I enrolled in the paralegal program and I ended up graduating at the top of my class. Uh, after completing that program, I was encouraged to continue my education. So I uh, enrolled in the bachelor's program in public safety management with a concentration in criminal justice. You know, Omar, I felt that I had a lot of experience getting arrested by the police and getting arrested by uh, 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 all these agents and appearing before judges that somehow or another that was going to parlay into classroom success. And it actually did. And I ended up graduating with highest honors. And eventually, I was accepted into law school. And in May of 2014, I graduated with a law degree from FIU College of Law. Wow, wow, that's uh, that's incredible. And, and I, you know, it, that's just an incredible story. And I think that going back to that democracy piece, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? We all make mistakes in life in, in some shape or form, but we 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 want to believe that we live in a system where people are given the second chances they deserve to turn around. And if you have the, the gall and the courage as you had to, to put in the work, you know, they change it all around, then there's nothing but good things that can come from that. But hold up, Omar, we got to wait a minute. We can't lose <laughs> sight of the fact that, man, I live in Florida. And so in spite of all that, in spite of all that I've been able to overcome and, and then even like during, while I was uh, in drug treatment, I had a spiritual transformation which caused me to really dedicate my life to giving back uh, to my community, to serving uh, 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 people less fortunate, you, knowing that I could use the tragedies of my life to turn it right. into triumph in other people's lives, right? And so I dove headfirst into community service and advocacy work while even going to law school. And, and when I graduated, because I lived in Florida, I can't even practice law, you know? Mm. And so I did all this, but the state of Florida would not allow me to even sit for the bar exam because my civil rights uh, were not restored. And right. so, yeah, it's great, you know, those stories are great, and, but I'd like to tell my people that I don't have, my story don't have a happy ending because we're still fighting these systems that, 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 that insist on holding us back in spite of the fact that we've overcome and we've clearly demonstrated that we just want to be a part of society. We just want to move on with our lives. And then of course, just wrapped up in those civil rights is the right to vote. And right. so- when, when well, that, brings you, that kind of that, brings me to, to my next question is that, you know, you were able to vote uh, for the first time in 30 years uh, as a result of Amendment 4, which is an effort that you led. And so what did that feel like? Wow. So um, let me tell you, um, when I was walking up to the, the uh, precinct, the polling location, uh, my mind just went back to all the, my ancestors, man, that was hung on trees, that was bitten by dogs, that was murdered, mm -hmm. that was burnt alive, that was had to go through fire hoses being sprayed on them just so I could have this opportunity to vote. And as I went in there, I also brought in the spirit of over 774,000 returning citizens in Florida that still was not going to have that opportunity to experience what I was getting ready to experience because they have outstanding fines and fees, right? And then I remember walking up to that voting booth by myself, right? And as I started to, to circle the names of the candidates that I wanted to choose, I had a, a, a almost like a paradigm shift. And I understood, man, that I was in a sacred place, man. That, mm. that I was in a sacred place in that voting booth and I was committing a sacred act by actually mm. voting. And so when you talk about how I felt, man, I had anger uh, because I knew the state of Florida was keeping people like me from voting. 
uh, but I also had reverence, just, uh, uh, just acknowledging the sacrifices that our ancestors made, the blood that was shed, just so I could have that opportunity, right? And, but I also had hope, right? I also had hope. And I, let me tell you, I had that reverence because at the end of the day, I knew that I was engaging in something that every American citizen should be afforded the opportunity to do so. And that's basically saying that I am, I am a human being, that my voice matters, that I count. And that transcends all the partisan uh, 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 nature of voting and it takes it to a much higher human element, you know, uh, that says that we exist and we do matter. Right. And, and there's a, uh, uh, after you voted, a, a federal appeals court ruled that Floridians um, with felonies had to pay fines before being able to vote. Um, you know, what, how are you attacking that, you and your team? Well, I'm, I, hey, listen, I'm going to attack it the same way our ancestors attacked things. Whenever there was obstacles thrown before us, you know, we took those as, a, 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 as those obstacles and turned them into opportunities, you know. And when I look at what my people have gone through, right, even in the light of, uh, of COVID-19 pandemic, I don't think right. COVID-19 had nothing on, on what my people went through because they had literally put their lives on the line and, and, and day in and day out. And so we're overcoming that obstacle because at the end of the day, we know that something is not right with that court ruling. Something's not right in the state of Florida. When you want to force someone to choose between putting food on their table or voting, right. forcing someone to choose between paying their rent or voting. And we know that democracy should be unencumbered and free. No one should have to pay to be able to vote. And so we're standing up and we're, you know, we are fighting back and we're creating opportunities for people across the country to actually right. donate into a fines and fees fund of which we're using 100% of those proceeds to actually help people who are too poor to pay those fines and fees, satisfy those legal financial obligations, get registered right. to vote and make sure that they have their voices heard in what we believe to be the most critical election this country has ever seen. Oh, for sure. And, and you said something earlier that was really profound. Uh, you said your human rights. And I, I, you know, it's interesting that people don't seem to equate the right to vote to human rights. It, it, it's, it's, it's all of our right to vote. And, and, and so I'm, where I'm leading is like, what keeps you in this fight? You know, where, you know, I've experienced, you know, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 all the isms you can <laughs> in America, right? But we keep fighting through and we keep fighting through and especially trying to get this younger generation to understand that this, this system, uh, this is how we get things done in, in real world time, that we have to go to the polls and we have to vote. And that's how we exercise our democratic power. So, you know, after all that you've gone through, what keeps you in this fight? Wow. You know, I can tell you two things, man. One, just recently, you know, we helped a young lady pay off her fines and fees. And as we went back to register her to vote, somewhere in between, in, in between that time frame, she went to visit her doctor. And her doctor gave her six months to live. Wow. I remember when our canvassers got to her house and she started crying and, and she was saying how she never thought that she would ever be able to vote. And she'd been trying for over 24 years uh, uh, to be able to vote, but she didn't think it was possible because of her felony conviction and her drug addiction. And, and, and Omar, as she was signing her, her name on that dotted line, uh, uh, finishing off that voter registration form, she looked to our canvases and asked our, asked our canvases to pray that God would allow her to live long enough to just be able to cast a ballot, right? Wow. And it's stories like that that, that, that keeps me going. But it's also understanding, man, that when you take away all of this partisan back and forth, that this system has just deteriorated to where there's so much division and, and, and hatred and, and fear. And if you peel all that away and just connect with people, you would see that there's so much that we as, as people, as American citizens desire and agree with and are in alignment with, but for the partisan deterioration and the back and forth. And I know that there is a goodness that, that when you look 
deep down inside someone else's soul that you know that they want to live in a place, right, where they're, where they're counted. They want to live in a place where they're treated with dignity and respect. They want to live in a place where they feel safe. That's what we all want, right? And so I am motivated to keep going because I know that the true heart and spirit of this country is much purer than what we're seeing right now with this partisan back and forth. Absolutely. I totally agree with you, Desmond. Um, I thank you once more, you know, when we did our thing before, you know, I think you're a, a true hero. Um, and I think that we have more in common than not. And, and you're absolutely right about the, the partisanship and, and what we see in the media, and even what we see on social media. But when you, when you get up close and personal with people, you know, everyone, we sort of share the same values and have the same hopes and dreams. Um, we just need our system to be able to work for all of that to be accounted for in the right way. Well, thank you, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. Thank you, Omar and Desmond, for that powerful conversation. It's really special, if not rare, for movement leaders to actually see the change they labored for. But Desmond was actually able to vote for the first time in 30 years as a direct result of the Amendment 4 effort he led in Florida. An inspiring example of being the change you seek in the world. So now that we've seen the connections between racial justice and democracy, it's our duty to be anti-racist and anti-corruption activists. And Coretta Scott King reminds us that struggle is a never ending process. Freedom is never really won. We earn it and win it in every generation. So that brings us to our call to action. And remember today is National Voter Registration Day. So please go to represent.us slash vote. Now there you can do several things. First and foremost, given the purging that I've outlined, number two on that list of seven deadly sins, right? Voter erasure or purges. Check your voter registration now, please. At again, represent.us slash vote. So you can check your voter registration there, verify it, make sure it's exactly what you think it is or you can just register to vote if you've never done that before, right? There's 7 million more uh, Zoomers uh, and young people, Gen Z and millennials who will be voting for the first time ever. Um, and also be sure to scroll uh, to the bottom of the page for additional resources where you can invite three friends to vote. Uh, you can also see a state-by-state -state breakdown of vote by mail and early voting. Um, and you can learn how to restore your vote. This is an important too. If you're unsure if you can vote because of a past felony conviction. Uh, you can also volunteer to be a poll worker for the 2020 election, um, since there is a deficit among seniors who are willing to go out given the COVID reality. Um, and also uh, you can contact, if you have outstanding questions, you can contact the election protection hotline and the number is listed there along with a hyperlink to the website. Um, now to a few logistics. We hope you'll let us know what you thought of today's event. We've linked our event survey in the comment section. If you'd like uh, to rewatch or share today's call, we'll email a video recording of today's call to all attendees. Now to stay up to date on future Unrig roundtables and represent us, Sign up for email updates on unrigsummit.com and represent.us. And remember, if you'd like to join Deborah and Angelica of Human in Common to engage in dialogue about feelings and experiences from viewing the history of racism in the US timeline, uh, and that was the timeline that we shared at the top of the call. If you wanna uh, debrief and process that with them, Immediately following this call, please go to represent.us slash timeline dash or hyphen call. Again, that's represent.us slash timeline dash call. Spots are limited to 100, so it's first come, first serve attendees. With that, 
Um, I'm gonna close out tonight. Uh, but before we do that, we've got one final performance. From the Bay Area, formerly signed to Interscope Records, they have toured with acts like Snoop Dogg, Akon, and the Black Eyed Peas. Please welcome Flipside coming to us tonight with a message of peace. And on behalf of Represent Us, Unrig, and our fantastic guests, thank you so much for joining tonight's Unrig Roundtable. Have a good night. Two, three. I don't need no rain today. This is America. But if it comes, I'll be okay. And in this land, let my flame burn through the We night. afforded certain unalienable yeah, rights. Be right Among them, today. life, Imagine liberty, and a pursuit Imagine of happiness. Love. All of which are impossible without democracy reform and racial justice. So let's get it. Look, we all need a little love. We never know it till the push come to shove. Some get it from the heavens up above. Some get it late night in the club. It don't matter where you get it if it's real. It's worth more than the dollar dollar bill. Cause if she love you, then she stay when you broke. And if he love you, he ain't never letting go. Them little babies need love like food. Even the soaks need a little love too. We need love in the hood and the birds. We need love in the mosque and the church. We need love in the pen and the schools. We need love, but we all gon' lose. They make a weapon out of hate and they kill. We make medicine from love and we heal. Oh, yeah, we need love. Imagine peace, imagine love. No more fear and no more war. It's the only way. Walk with me to a brighter day. Yeah, imagine peace, imagine love. No more fear and no more we need war. Love. It's the only way. Walk with me to a brighter day. I don't need. But if it comes, I'll be okay. I'll let my flame burn through the night. Yeah, we gonna be alright. I don't need no rain today. But if it comes, I'll be okay. I'll let my flame burn through the night. Yeah. We gonna be all right. And I was walking through this world and seen atrocities, monopolies. The prophecy was written and all I could see is all I could see in visions. And so I'm on a mission to envision new additions. Cause I can't stand the rain and all the pain in which we live in. And talking about the problem, never solved it. We throw some action on it and dissolve it. Them kids got revolvers because they think it make them stand taller. And all he wanted to be was a baller, a G and a shot caller. We didn't love him, so we lost him. It happens often from Oakland, Compton to Boston, and boys often. And then the cops off the boys while we filmed it Got mad, marched and made noise It's a cycle, devastation is racism plus a rifle It's amazing, we live in life in a blindfold Ain't no justice and no peace But what's peace without L-O-V-E We need love Imagine peace, imagine love No more fear, yeah, and no more need war love. It's the only way Walk with me to a brighter day yeah. We need love Imagine peace, imagine love what does it take to be free what does it take to be free what does it mean for equality what does it mean for equality justice justice peace peace justice justice peace and we scream equality 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 what does it take to be free what does it take to be free what does it mean for equality what does it mean for equality what does it take to be free what does it take to be free what does it mean for equality what does it mean for equality justice justice peace peace justice justice peace and we scream equality 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 justice justice peace peace justice justice peace
streets and we scream equality, equality, equality.